Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me for our weekly roundup on geopolitics and markets is Rob Larity, our chief investment officer. I don't know about y'all, but it's been a difficult week on my end. It feels like uh, every piece of machinery or technology that I rely on to do my job or live in this world decided to break this week and it is testing my patience. Enough uh, moaning and wailing and gnashing of teeth for me. Let's get to the conversation. Cheers. See you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security that does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. We're back. It's another week. I can't believe it's already been another week. Um, my house is crazy right now, Rob. I've got an AC guy trying to fix the AC. I've got a dude painting this room over here. I've got some guy who's putting in a cabinet over here. It's a cacophony of noises here. So if you hear any banging or loud sounds, um, I don't have Maggie, my mother-in-law's dog this time around. I just have people working in my house. Nice to be with you. What's going on with you, Rob? Oh, not too much. Uh, moving out here. So that's keeping us busy. Yeah, we're moving to, to, uh, to Paris. We're relocating there. Uh, a week from now. Well, before you leave these shores, uh, there's tons going on in markets and in, in the U.S. in particular. So let's just start with what you're seeing in the market this week. And then I know you've got some some things to talk about in terms of U.S. macro. Is Would it be, I don't know if it's correct to call them a divergence, but it sounded like something was diverging in what you were looking at. So tell us what you're thinking overall right now in this crazy market, because it, it feels like it's been it feels like it's been wacky for a couple of weeks. Is that just me? I mean, I don't know if that's just the geopolitics is flowing over my head, but it feels like markets and geopolitics and tandem have been sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, like vibrating quite a bit. And at least on the geopolitical side, it's slowed a little this week. doesn't feel like it did for markets, but you tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's been wacky for like the last six or seven years. At least yeah. it feels that way. That's true. Um, no, so just for an update, um, what we're essentially seeing is kind of the um, extension of what we've been experiencing for the last month or so, which is U.S. dollar strength, equities um, falling and testing their lows. Um, so we saw a pretty sharp reversal in equities earlier this week. So we're kind of having this seesaw effect, very sharp moves in either direction. Um, so there's a there's a battleground uh, uh, playing out here near the lows of the year. So if you don't have a chart in front of you, you can picture this as the the double bottom, and now we're kind of chopping around at the trough. Um, so that's uh, the equity market. Uh, the dollar is trying to make new highs against all of these currencies, and it's not able to do so yet. And really, what seems to be happening is there's a debate that's raging, which is, um, is the U.S. economy actually slowing in response to the Fed's uh, hawkishness on interest rates and the interest rate tightening? And that's a debate that I think you could really go either way on um, at this point, because, you know, as you mentioned, there are divergences. I guess cross currents might be um, another way to, to phrase it, because just in the last week, I, I went through our knowledge platform, our internal research platform, and just kind of counted up the different things that we were noticing. And it's funny to see how so many things are going in opposite directions. So you have the Fed trying to strangle house uh, owners, essentially, or home buyers, I should say. And that seems to be working very well. So mortgage applications for purchasing a home have collapsed in the last uh, several weeks. This is a weekly data point that comes out. Well, to, did, did, did I see right that mortgages, like the mortgage rate was over 7% this week? Is that, do I see that right? Oh, I don't know if it got over seven. Seven. It's in the, it's in the high sixes for high sure. Sixes. It's higher than we've seen in our lives, <laughs> uh, or at least in, in recent memory. Um, so predictably that's causing 
applications for new mortgages and and people going out and buying homes to collapse. And um, so you're starting to see that weakness flow through. And we mentioned uh, last week that you had the first month over month decline in house prices in the US. So it's starting to flow through. What we've seen this week is some additional data on multifamily demand really starting to roll over. So some market observers in the apartment multifamily uh, market have come out and said, look, you know, we're really starting to see a, a, a significant and sharp uh, decline in demand for multifamily units. So household formation, in other words, is reversing. Like, so under the, under the pandemic, we saw household formation expand. So people had more money. You didn't have to live with your parents. You didn't have to live with a roommate more human bodies occupying more units. Um, and now we're seeing that go the other way because of affordability and, and other issues like that. So that's a big driver of housing markets back down. Um, and we're hearing that in sort of the scuttlebutt that we do just in bottom-up research. So we uh, had a call with a contact uh, in our network this week who said, he, he works with a development group, residential development group, and he said they're starting to get all these offers from multifamily developers who are just getting squeezed by interest rates and they're desperate to unload these properties or these projects that they've been developing, um, which is not something that he had seen until very recently. So you can see that's moving very quickly. So that's the negative side. Um, commercial office we could talk about, that's a disaster, which we can say for another day because it's a whole story in itself um, with work from home and that. Um, but then on the other side, so retail real estate, just to keep on the real estate theme, is, is booming again. So the retail vacancy rate at 6.1% is the lowest it's been in 15 years. Hmm. And retail rents were up 16% year over year. Um, as of the most recent data point. So you have those weird cross currents happening within real estate. And then more broadly, um, I guess two other things that we noticed this week that were interesting were, so we talked about the Inflation Reduction Act and these um, uh, incentives to invest in renewable energy and projects related to infrastructure and things like that. Well, some of the estimates are coming out and uh, it's pretty shocking, the numbers being thrown around. And I don't know how accurate these are. And there's a lot of uncertainty, according to what we hear, about how this is actually going to um, you know, hit the road when, when it all comes down to it. But uh, for example, Credit Suisse came out this week and said that they estimate, because these incentives are essentially uncapped, you can get unlimited incentives as long as you meet certain requirements. Hmm. So the number that the CBO gave uh, as its estimate, which was $374 billion, which is a remarkably precise estimate, <laughs> um, is just a wild guess of how much people are going to take this up. Um, so Credit Suisse came out this week and said, well, they think it could be $800 billion to $1.7 trillion, not the $374 billion that the CBO is citing. And you're seeing all these anecdotes of companies accelerating their investment in battery plants and renewables and solar voltaic, um, uh, photovoltaic uh, power generation. Um, so that's moving in the opposite direction of what the Fed is trying to accomplish. <laughs> so there's a geopolitical or political theme here, which I think maybe you can opine on, which is you know, the right hand and the left hand doing different things um, because maybe they have different goals and objectives, but there's a lot of chop out there at the moment. Yeah, I hesitate to make the point I'm about to make because it, it, it almost seems stupid in my head and maybe some of it is just that I don't know enough history, but it does seem to me like when the pandemic happened and the economy shut down, um, then a couple of weeks later, like things started to rev up and you got all these weird spikes in different asset classes. So I remember you had lumber and you had um, all these kind of weird things and everybody was kind of like, oh, that's weird, like lumber prices or whatever. And then it moved towards energy and gasoline prices went to the moon and food prices hit records. Um, but then all that went down and like real estate has been going up steadily, like ridiculously um, since the pandemic started, I remember I closed on this house that I'm in right now where the AC 
is making me want to self-immolate because it just won't work correctly. Um, but I, I bought this house totally accidentally the week before we closed the week before the pandemic, uh, or I should say the week before everything locked down. And I was terrified that I was about to make the worst financial decision of my life. Um, and at least over the past year, it's been the best financial decision of my life. Like, as I look at the value of, of what my house is supposed to bring over time and sales in the neighborhood, like real estate's been kind of great. So I make that point to say, I feel like everything has kind of done this weird up and down thing since COVID, since we tried to reboot the economy. And I just, part of me, I mean, part of me wonders if it's real estate's turn because it was just kind of going up and up and up. And that's why the Fed, I guess, wanted to come in. And I go back to what you're saying about the right hand and the left hand, not knowing what it's doing. Um, is the Fed like, you know, <laughs> going too hard on something that really wasn't going to matter all that much to the actual economy? And it's actually, uh, I don't know. But then the flip side of that is if, if, as you say, companies are continuing with CapEx and stuff like that, even as interest rates are up, then the Fed's probably doing the right thing. Because just imagine if they were continuing to run it hot and how, how bad inflation would get. So I don't know. Am I, am, do you feel like it, it's always like this, that markets are always just peaking and, and declining? Or do you think there's something to this idea that um, the COVID reboot of the economy. It's like we, we had to reboot different sections at different times and it's not all, and we're still sort of digesting the, the total stoppage that we had for a couple of weeks. Well, I think it's partly COVID and it's partly a broader issue, which is disorganization. So we've talked in the past about how it used to be most of the big economic regions of the world, which are essentially the US, Europe and China, that they would move in some kind of lockstep in most cycles. And that really in the last five or six years, and especially after COVID, that just went totally haywire. And now they're all flying off in different directions. But even within you know, these economic regions, you're seeing things move at cross purposes much more than they did before. Like mm -hmm. COVID has been an, a huge accelerant of this because it just introduced weird stoppages and starts that were not based on, you know, economic cycles. It was based on policy and, you know, the progression of the virus, but also just the response to the virus. I mean, we had the biggest fiscal stimulus ever. I mean, by, uh, by an order of magnitude. Yeah. Um, and now we're clamping on the brakes, you know, in response to that. So you have sort of this start stop um, dynamic going on while different actors are trying to do different things. You know, the Biden administration wants to invest and put in place these spending programs and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and the Fed has a mandate to keep price inflation under control. So really, for the first time in quite a long time, you're seeing that at total cross purposes. Um, I mean, it's hard to think of a time when fiscal and monetary policy was so, um, if, if ever, was so at odds with each other. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain, but I can't really think about it. I mean, maybe, I, I don't know that I was, I was trying to go back to the 1920s and like Hoover before the, before the crash and like Smoot Hawley and all that other stuff. But it's, it's hard to come up with something, but you said, um, well, how does that make you feel about markets though? Then? Cause I, before we got on the, the, before I hit the record button, I should say you were thinking that maybe equities were looking, looking like they were going to rip off of that double bottom. Are you still, are you still feeling a little optimistic or is it more like we're in this uncertain, you're, we're in this uncertain camp and we're just kind of waiting for which way it's going to go. I'm optimistic in the short term. Um, you know, we're, we've been positioned tactically more long equities um, than we had been for most of the last 18 months. Yeah. Over sort of the five-year horizon, I'm not particularly optimistic. I don't think that you can passively buy a market index and expect to make any money probably for a very long time, given all of the uh, dominoes that are stacked against you. So, you know, corporate profit margins you know, coming down from all time highs, interest rates coming up from all time lows, um, you know, debt levels reaching the peaks that they have both at the mm -hmm. government and the corporate uh, sector side of things. All of those things are going to be massive headwinds. Like the, the days of, you know, seeing your 401k portfolio, you know, triple in, in six or seven years because you just sat there and did nothing 
are probably never going to happen in our lifetime again, frankly. Um, but to, to address what you spoke about earlier, I don't think that we have seen something like this before because I think what you're seeing is, um, first of all, we have the tools to do things that we never did during the 1920s and 1930s, for example. Um, like if you look at the size of the federal government at that point, it was teeny tiny. Like it, it took the trauma of the Great Depression to really provide the mandate to get the government as big as it has become. Like before then, it was like the pimple on the butt of the US private sector. Yeah. Now it's an, obviously a different story. Um, and with those tools, you know, we come again to this, this theme of the Fed and policymakers always being backward looking because that's, that's just how government works. You can't, you know, you can't be too adventurous in making projections. You have to essentially root things in what's already in front of people's face and taking these signals. Oh, inflation's high. Clamp on the brakes. Oh, we're in a pandemic. Throw three trillion of stimulus at it. Um, lots of people being reactive and not proactive and being reactive, you know, to signals that are rapidly going up and down, at least by kind of economic cycle standards. Yeah. So volatility is the name of the game. It's going to be like this for quite a while because it's self-perpetuating. Well, I th that's as good a segue as we're going to get, I think, to talking about because that that's an argument for planning and stuff like that. And we, we've talked about this a little bit the last two weeks, but maybe we go and talk a little bit about China because it's not like their careful planning has done them any good at all either because their economy is not doing well at all, or maybe there are some small signs of, of the economy going doing good. I've got some things on my mind about China, but what's what's on your mind about China right now? I know we've been we've been keeping our finger on it pretty closely here. As far as new stuff, I don't have anything particularly new that's popped out to me. But on the planning side, I would give them some credit because the the reason why China has gotten to where it is, is because of, I don't know if planning is the right word, but no, because but of the kind of East Asian growth model, which involves a lot of control and planning. Um, the problem is that once you, once you reach a certain point, that becomes counterproductive. And we've been in that point for a long time. So I, I wouldn't necessarily bash China for, for that, uh, for having that model. But, um, I wanted to ask you about the drought and agricultural developments in China. I think that's the most interesting thing this week that we've been looking at. Yeah. It's been something on my radar for, I, I guess we, we can call it eight weeks now. I mean, it's, it's been a lot, but so the, the drought has been awful and it's been fairly historic and it's still going on. So, I mean, like record high temperatures, in large parts of southern China and alerts about drought in large parts about southern China. And we're talking about even the Chinese government, which is fairly circumspect about what it admits, has been warning about, you know, massive reductions in yields. And China actually has been importing lots of grain in sort of the last 12 to 24 months, maybe saving up for a rainy day. The the confusing thing about all this is that if China really is dealing with this generational drought, you would think that they would continue to import grains at a high rate. Um, I've seen it out there in you know financial media that, oh, the, the COVID-19 caps are causing them to, to import less grain. But that doesn't really make sense to me because that's you still have to eat even if you're in a COVID-19 shutdown. So they're still going to import, especially if they feel like they've got these um, this drought head when facing them. And if you look at China's imports of everything from you know, soybeans are down 9% January through August. Corn purchases down 21% January through August. Wheat's down 10%. Barley's down 43%. If you kind of look across the board, China's importing a lot less when it comes to agricultural commodities. Um, one kind of bright spot, or bright spot for China, I should say, um, is that it seems like they're finally showing some signs that they've recovered from their African swine fever pork uh, epidemic. Um, so for those of you who are not following Chinese pork markets like Liz Truss and yours truly on a regular basis, um, the, the Chinese had this outbreak of African swine fever a couple of years ago. It decimated the Chinese hog herd. I don't think there's been a, 
a worse Holocaust for pigs in the history of, of pig civilization. It was a really bad time for them. Um, but they've been slowly kind of re, um, rebuilding um, their pork industry and the the disruption of African swine fever. Actually, it was always going to do good things for China because they were going to move from mom and pop smaller farms to larger industrial type farms, which are safer and more hygienic and you can produce more and be more efficient and all that other kind of stuff. And so China's pork output, highest in years, um, highest uh, all the way back to sort of 2015, um, if you look at the production numbers right now, and the only places that I can find where China's actually importing more on the agricultural commodity index is things that get fed to pigs. So, for instance, um, whey is up a lot, even though things like milk powder and, and cream and cheese are way down. So th- there's something going on um, in China itself with the pork industry and there's something also going on with the drought and something also going on with the rain with the grain and i i don't have a really good answer for all of it um the last thing i'll just say is that um in addition to having to deal with the drought and the drought doesn't just cause agricultural problems it also causes power problems because it means a lot of dams are low in china so they're going to have to move to coal or other energy resources to make up for the hydro stuff Um, but it's not just that you've got heat wave and drought in parts of southern china northern china this weekend is going to have a hard cold snap so as one part of the country is is super dry and is not growing things very well the northern part of the country is going to have a cold snap you're going to increase energy demand on both scores um, in a global energy environment that's already uh, feeling the squeeze a little bit after coming off the boil so there that there's a lot of data there that i don't exactly know what to make sense of um, but all those things um, sort of have me concerned especially when i'm I'm talking to U.S. agricultural producers. I mean, I've, I've been telling U.S. farmers uh, for years, like China's a bonus. Like, don't base your entire strategy on China because um, you never exactly know um, when the other foot's going to drop. And it's and this is one of those times where that that call looks fairly um, fairly perceptive because all the data is telling me they should be importing like crazy, and they're not importing like crazy. So I, I don't exactly know what to make of that. Yeah, and the catalyst for looking at this <clears throat> in detail this week was we saw that lean hog futures prices all of a sudden just really fell off a cliff in the last um, four or five weeks, which was a, an interesting development because there was no obvious change in the U.S. Uh, pork market. Um, you know, as you're saying that, Jacob, I'm just I'm I'm thinking, and this is totally speculative. Um, but we did see a major Chinese uh, industrial metals trading house, which specialized in, in copper, um, having liquidity problems uh, in the last few weeks. There was a piece in the Financial Times about this. I wonder if you're seeing anything similar with um, uh, with ag traders there, where they uh, there might be a liquidity issue, someone running down their inventories in order to boost their liquidity position, boost their working capital. This, I have no idea. It's totally speculation. But No, we have, a, we have several listeners who would be well positioned to tell us uh, if that's happening. So if you're out there and listening to this, shoot us an email, guys, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll update the listeners um, next week on what's going on. Um, but yes, I mean, that, that, um, that copper liquidity issue was one of the reasons we got a little spooked on Chile and decided to reduce our, ex- our exposure to Chile, even though we're still pretty long-term bullish on the country. Um, but the, the flip side of China's liquidity issues, which is a good way of talking about the real estate um, or just checking in on the real estate problem, is that I'm, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say that uh, <laughs> the situation is okay, but it hasn't necessarily gotten worse. Um, it actually looks like week on week there, um, you actually saw a small increase, um, in terms of, um, Chinese real estate purchases. It's still down year on year, like nothing, it's not like there's any kind of recovery, but in addition to that, um, it seems like China's also rolling out bigger measures to support the real estate market. Um, so, I mean, they announced another 85 billion in property funding before the party Congress. Um, they are there. They announced some rare income tax breaks to spur more house purchases to try and, and, and bring up, um, home prices. And you saw Chinese property stocks actually rallied after the support of, of these lifelines and things like that. Um, it's not again, like with China, you can always find the data that's telling you the opposite thing. Like one of the things I flagged earlier this week was that, 
um, you know, China's property woes has has led to something like an eight percent decline in cement production so far this year. So you're you're still finding sort of these little problems and things like that. But um, I would think that if it's a liquidity problem, the Chinese government will come to the rescue eventually because it's it's one thing for Xi Jinping to make an example of irresponsible property developers. It's quite another to not be able to import. Um, grains and other foodstuffs that China needs at the level that they're going to need it, depending on this drought. So. Well, liquidity problems are the sort of problems that they can fix all day long. Um, solvency problems then are, are a different thing. Um, yeah. Speaking of commodities, I don't want to jump the gun, but jump I really would love to hear. I'd love to hear what you think about the Saudi cuts. Because you've spoken about, I remember at the time when when Joe Biden went to uh, Saudi Arabia, you expressed a lot of wonder at that, and it doesn't seem like much has changed. So, what do you think is going on in their heads, and what do you think are the likely ramifications of all this? Like, what is the U.S. going to do? Yeah, w- wonder is a diplomatic word for. I, although I don't remember exactly what I said. Um, this is the second week in a row I want to get up on my soapbox and I'll try not to, but I'll tell you that, um, and I, I actually say this to most audiences too. I, Saudi Arabia is one of the countries I have the hardest time being objective about. Um, there's nothing about that regime that I like. Um, it, I, I think it, it represents like an almost medieval fundamentalist religious. I, I don't like any, any, any part of it. And, and even aside from that, I don't understand how a big gas station in the middle of the desert is going to, you know, go vision 2030 and become this huge tech economy. Like all of it just kind of smacks of, of, um, of illusions and dreams and mirages in the desert for me. So let's, let's put my biases, let's go put them on, on, on the desk behind me here and forget about them for a second. Um, I still don't quite understand what the U.S. got out of its meeting with um, with MBS. So Biden went all the way to Saudi Arabia. He humbled himself in front of MBS, even though he talked talked some serious shit about him before, like becoming president, and even threw him some shade while he was president. Um, and I don't want to say kiss the ring, but I mean humbled himself, like tried to make amends, tried to get the Saudis on board. Uh, and you know Biden's top priority at that point was how do we get gasoline prices down in the United States? And that was another thing. I was like, why why are you worried so much about gasoline prices? I get it, but like there are other problems here. I don't get why gasoline prices are are the biggest issue. Um, and it seems like Saudi Arabia's just kind of thumbed its nose at at the U.S. and is not interested in doing in, anything with it or helping it in any way. And that makes sense from a purely um, if you're just thinking about Saudi Arabia self-interest, they have no interest in driving down the price of oil right now. They've been dealing with incredibly low oil prices um, going back 2014, 2015. Um, as I often remind folks, the the week or two before it became clear that COVID was going to be the story of the next couple of years, uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia uh, were engaged in a price war for oil that Saudi Arabia started. They wanted to push Russia out of the market entirely, and they decided to cut their prices super low so that they could knock Russia out and then start charging higher prices on top of that sort of thing. Um, it's weird to go full circle and say two years later, now the Saudis are looking at the Russians who have invaded Ukraine, who they have issues with. Um, in term- I mean, Russia has a closer relationship with Iran now. That's Saudi Arabia's big rival in the region. But so now they're going to make sort of common cause with the Russians and say, hey, you want oil prices up. We want oil prices up. None of us want the United States um, to get what it wants necessarily right now. So why don't we push forward? So I I don't know how to read what Saudi Arabia is doing much more than um, they really are turning away from the United States. Um, they're going at it sort of more alone and thinking just in terms of how to get energy prices up. Um, and that's that. The only caveat I'll, I'll put in there is that, you know, I think the increase is going to be something like Two million barrels per day, I think, was what was reported. What, uh, or I'm sorry, they're going to decrease. I should say they're going to decrease production roughly about two million barrels per day. Um, and I will say, and I've seen this point made out there, but I'll just repeat it. Um, it's not like OPEC was meeting its quota in terms of production. So for most of my lifetime as an analyst, um, the the issue with OPEC was seeing who was cheating the quota by pumping more. Uh, the last year and a half, it's been who's not hitting their quotas at all. And now how is that affecting sort of global production? And we can thank Nigeria in particular, but Libya's sort of start and stop thing with oil production also sort of adds into this. So if you actually add up what the cuts are going to be in terms of actual barrels per oil that are actually available, probably not that two bi- that two million figure, probably maybe 500,000, 700,000, who knows. But it's still the political signal 
I mean, it's a massive fuck you to the to the White House. I don't know how else you can view it. Um, and I, I would think that in the White House, they're smarting from the fact that they expended political capital uh, to try and get the Saudis on board. And they didn't really need them. Like the releases from the Strategic Reserve and some of the other things the Biden administration did accomplished what needed to be accomplished. So um, I, don't, I, I don't see the Saudi-U.S. relationship ever going back to the way that it was going to be before, certainly not as long as the U.S. is, is not importing massive amounts of oil from Saudi Arabia. Um, but it's, it's harder for me to parse kind of what, what happens next and what Saudi Arabia thinks the next step in this game is because, um, well, I don't know, maybe they see the, the chaos in Iran and think that, okay, well, Iran's never going to be a partner anyway, so we don't have to worry about the nuclear deal. Let's just get ours. Maybe it's as cold-hearted as that. Do you think there's any implications for the other powers in the region, like Turkey or Iran, or does their position to the U.S. change in any way? I well, I <laughs> have you ever heard the old joke about how um, they uh, it's it's like an old medieval Christian town, and um, they they decide to uh, they, they want to hire somebody who's going to blow the bugle every day uh, until Jesus Christ comes back. Um, and so they interview all these candidates and one day a Jew shows up to be interviewed for the job and he's the best bugle player and he's so nice and kind and he's willing to work on all the Christian holidays. Like it's, it's totally good. But so they bring him in for the final interview and they say, look, we just have one question. Like, why does a Jew want to be, you know, sounding the bugle before Jesus Christ comes back every day for the rest of his life? And the Jew says, no, well, it's steady living. So like, I, I feel like, I, I feel like the Jew in that scenario, uh, sounding the bugle, because I've been saying now for God, like since 2018, that eventually the U S is going to find out that it needs Iran more than it needs Saudi Arabia. And then if they don't get some kind of, be- they don't even need a great relationship with Iran. If Iran isn't just a meaningful counterweight to Turkish influence in the region, then Turkey's going to run roughshod over the entire region. And Saudi Arabia is not going to like that much is not going to like that very much either. You might even get a day when Riyadh and Tehran are on the same page because the Turks are running all over the place. Um, like when the Ottomans sort of um, um, were calling all the shots in the Middle East. So th- that's my, t- I geopolitically, that's, that's to me what has to happen. The United States wants to get out of the Middle East. It wants to build some kind of balance of power. Iran has to be one of those powers. Saudi Arabia, the Arab Gulf states, they have to be one of those powers. Turkey is one of those powers. But I've been saying that for years and I've been wrong about that. And I was wrong this year about the Iran nuclear deal um, going back into place too. So um, th- that's my answer. But I also think I have to get at the point where I apparently I need to re-update my views because it's just it's not happening the way that you would think it would happen just in terms of the straight geopolitics. Because for whatever reason, the United States doesn't feel like it can get what it needs out of Iran. But just you know, one final caveat there, the next episode we're posting of um, this podcast is an interview with an Iranian political analyst, um, and Iran's in trouble. So if you got a regime change there, or if something happened that flipped Iran to a, a regime that was uh, more favorable to the West, now we're talking like geopolitical earthquake, and it's in the cards now in a way that it wasn't even the cards sort of a month or two ago. So I'm uh, I'm moving the goalposts on you a little bit there, but what the Saudis are going to do with oil, like, eh, like it doesn't matter. I don't think that much to the other countries in the region. A much bigger deal would be if something happens in Iran that changes its strategic orientation. Um, that's the other dirty little secret about the Saudis. Like they aren't that important. They don't have a military. Like yes, they buy a bunch of military technology. They don't know how to use it. They have. They can't even you know d- do well in this civil war in Yemen. They're not a meaningful counterweight to anyone. The only thing they have is oil and. If, if we if we again if we put my biases on the table the only things we can say about them clear-headed is they wanted the price of oil to go up and they were willing to work with Russia to do it and they didn't care about the political costs to the relationship it has with Washington or they didn't think there would be costs to the political relationship with Washington and that's the best I can I can muster and yet they wanted prices to go up and we we speak here often about markets having a certain wisdom to them and in that light, it's very interesting to see what crude oil prices have done since this news has really started to trickle out, which is, you know, if you were to picture the chart, crude oil really broke down to a new low about a month ago, and it got as low as $75 a barrel in on the West Texas uh, 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 spot price. And it's been rebounding since um, 
you know, it started trickling into the wires that this was going to happen. And then on the news itself, it's back up to $88 a barrel, but that's still significantly below where it was even six weeks ago or eight weeks ago. So it's it's re- rebounded back into that uh, prior support, which is now kind of the ceiling. And I think that says a very big thing because that was a big bazooka that they tried to pull out there. And it was a big F you to the, to the U.S., and if that's all they can do is get sort of a counter trend rally and oil is still kind of sagging and, and looking like it could fall over, um, that's that's pretty uninspiring. Yeah, although, I mean, the interesting thing about oil is even if Mr. Market is smart, like oil is a little artificial because it's a controlled market. Like OPEC is a cartel, which modeled itself after the Texas Railroad Commission literally for decades. Even Can we talk about centuries? I mean, oil prices have not been allowed to function the way that the market wants them to function. If it was just free market, um, no, no cartels, nobody curtailing production and things like that, oil would be relatively cheap. I mean, like there, there's plenty of it. The problem is not that there's enough of it. So um, I think the market is smart at sussing out, okay, within these constraints, within this system, this is how it works and this is how when things go up and how, how things go down. But I, I've been getting a little frustrated with um, the market in general when it comes to oil. But the second thing I was going to say, Rob, because you were saying that um, oil prices didn't really rebound that much um, about the news after the the Saudis pulled out the bazooka. And I was even at dinner with some friends last night, friends who were not overly uh, observant of the price of crude oil. And that even came up. Uh, One of them said like, oh, I saw the Saudis at the crude stuff. But this goes back to what I was saying earlier. If you look at the actual impact on the barrels per day on the market technically, there's not that much of a change. So in that sense, the Sa- that, that's another thing that makes the Saudi move actually somewhat confusing to me because they gave the United States the FU, but there was no way that 2 million barrels was going to um, raise the price of oil that much. They would have needed to say something more like 3 million or 4 million, something that wasn't just going to pick up for the, Ni- for the Nigerians not being able to produce and for uncertainty around Libya. So... Um, yeah, just I, I wonder if that affects what you think about oil not um, um, not bouncing on the Saudi news, because in that sense, it really wasn't a bazooka. It was really just them wanting to say, all right, we're actually going to do we're actually going to produce the quotas that we said we were going to produce. Um, it's not so much an increase. It's just like, let's make sure that we can make money, even as the as the Nigerians are not pumping. A bit of a cynical play, you mean? A little bit. But again, that also doesn't, I don't understand why you would want to kick the United States when it's down there in that point of view. And it also doesn't make sense because when when the reporting started about the about OPEC plus increase in their production, it started as a Russian suggestion, not as a Saudi suggestion. It started as, oh, Russia has suggested this and then Saudi Arabia has agreed to it. And maybe that would have made sense six months ago, but Russia's getting its ass whooped right now. There is no reason for Saudi Arabia, like everybody's running away from Russia. The Chinese are putting distance between themselves and Russia. Modi came out and criticized Xi Jinping himself. So I, I don't know if Saudi Arabia is looking to pick up a friend on the on the, on the the down low, but they're not going to because Russia's a ra- relationship with Iran is way more important um, than anything Russia is going to do with, with Saudi Arabia. So it's also a weird time to look like you're making common cause with the Russians and the Saudis must have known that's how that was going to be read. They're pretty good <laughs> at, at PR, uh, sort of overall. Just look at the way they've been able to entice people with their vision of their modern country when they're literally you know, living in the Stone Ages when it comes from a religious perspective. So, well, Let me ask you a question. I don't want to go down a big rabbit hole here, but I had actually written this in my notebook as something to ask you. Um, do you think, because this is a bit of a head scratcher, as you point out, um, and similarly, we were kind of thrown for a loop with the Russian war. And as you pointed out, like it didn't make rational sense. It wasn't in their interests to do what they did in so many ways. Um, do you think that when you're doing geopolitical analysis like this, that you need to try to adjust for the sort of personal power quotient of a certain nation? So like Putin is an individual who may act for all sorts of reasons that we don't understand. Um, And MBS, I don't really have a great sense for how much individual power he has. I know traditionally Saudi was sort of a 
almost like a feudal system where there was a lot of balanced interests that needed to be taken into account and you know the big the big family and and there was a lot of voices i think that's less than it was but um it's not clear to me if to what extent it's changed but do you think that this is perhaps just a case of like mbs not doing something that's in their interests or doing something that's sort of irrational because it's an emotional or a or a personal thing um that is hard to calculate or is it something else? Um, well, it's, it's an impossible question to answer in some ways. I can tell you that the, the area that I've differed with the people who trained me in geopolitics, so whether it's George Friedman or, um, I, I wouldn't say Peter Zihon trained me, but I was his colleague for several years. Roger Baker, I would say had a large hand in my training. Uh, even Marco Papich, who was on this podcast a lot, um, they say the individual doesn't matter. And I've always chafed against that. I've always said the individual does matter. I don't know if geopolitics tells you, can tell you anything about individuals, though. Um, there's no geopolitical crystal ball in my office that allows me to see what Putin's going to decide and what MBS is going to decide. Um, now, we can say, like, we need to do empathetic analysis and put ourselves in the shoes of Putin or MBS. Um I have a pretty flexible mind. I've proven I can't get in the shoes of Vladimir Putin for better and for worse. Like that's just not a brain that I'm able to inhabit and, and understand how it works. But you're also outside of the realm now of geopolitics and you're really in the realm of intelligence. You're really in the realm of, I need somebody who served Putin breakfast yesterday morning and can tell me that he put on the smoking jacket that he wears before he makes a big decision. And that's how I know that something's going to happen, um, which is why geopolitics likes to stay away from short term time horizon things. It's why it's so hard, I think, also to marry geopolitics and um and trading and market recommendations, because geopolitics gets more and more scared of making any kind of calls because it is aware of the lack of information that it has on things on a very, very short time horizon. So I think you're absolutely probably right. We have some data to substantiate that. I mean, MBS has taken a bigger role in the last couple of years and even in the last couple of weeks has taken a much bigger role in Saudi Arabia um, in terms of the governance of it. He's already the crown prince, but the king seems to have stepped back a, a bit and has appointed him prime minister. He's doing things his own way. He absolutely probably took Biden's comments personal. I, I would I would be willing to wager he didn't mind embarrassing Biden in that way and wanted to show him up a little bit. Um, I don't necessarily think it's best for um, U.S. Saudi relations in the long term. But I mean, again, to what you said about being cynical, um, it might also just not not matter that much if the Iranians are going to double down and the IRGC is going to take more control over the Iranian economy and Erdogan's crazy and has his own problems with the United States. The Saudis might just be saying like, all right. So what? You're going to slap us on the wrist? Like ultimately, like you know that we set oil prices to a certain degree, and you, Mr. Biden, are coming up on the midterms. So you're not going to you're not going to cause us problems right now. So we're going to teach you a lesson. This is what happens when you try to to restart the JCPOA. I, I can make that argument. It, it seems fairly short sighted for me. I think that won't end well as a policy, but that's certainly a possibility. But there's also no way. The other reason that thesis starts to get difficult is it's not really falsifiable. Like there's no, there's nothing I can find to disprove that thesis on my own, you know, and there's, there's no indicator, like there's not an equity I can buy and go long or short. That's going to tell me whether my trade was right on whether that was what was in MBS's head. So in some sense, that's why it's so important, I think, to, um, deal with your biases, however you need to, and get rid of them. Um, and there are different ways for dealing with biases. Marco has been on this podcast many times. He, you know, basically says he has no biases. He doesn't care about anything. I go the complete opposite direction. I care deeply about everything. Um, so I just say what I care about, but then I'm able to compartmentalize it and put it on a shelf and not think about it. Like I, I can do that. What I can't do is pretend like I'm a sociopath. Um, so everybody has their way of doing that. But I, I somehow got into thinking about thinking, which is how it's, we always seem to end up here, Rob. <laughs> We're just so darn philosophical around here. Well, I guess so. Um, uh, oh, oh, anything else on that score or did I, did, did we do a good job? Well, I, I, I mean, I was just going to say the nice thing about being investors and not philosophers or, you know, pundits is at the end of the day, all that matters is what the price does. Yep. So we can be very pragmatic about forming these theories and testing them. Um, but at least we have this objective measure that we can hang our hat on. We do. And it's made me working with you over the past two years even has made me a much better geopolitical analyst. 
because in some ways I don't have to figure out, you know, what does it look like if I'm right? What does it look like if I'm wrong? I have very clear indicators that tell me whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. And it's not, it's almost depersonalized. It doesn't matter what my political views are. It matters like what happens with the trade, to your point. Um, but that is a great segue to, to jump into the last thing we should probably address before we let the listeners go, which is also a highly charged emotional topic. I'm less emotional about this one. It's funny the things we, we, we get in a, we, that gets stuck in our craw. Um, Brazil's elections, um, first round happened. Bolsonaro, I guess, did better than the polls suggested. I think that that's been overstated. Like it was all within the margin of error and it was always Lula got just about what he was supposed to in the polls. And then Bolsonaro got sure a little more than most suggested, but there was always a big basket of undecideds and you, I, it was not an unreasonable conclusion to think that some of those undecideds were Bolsonaro supporters who didn't want to tell the pollsters that they were voting for somebody who said that COVID could tr- or the COVID vaccine could turn you into cr- into a crocodile. So, like, um, I, I think there's, I, I don't think it's completely out of the bounds of, of what's happening. I thought the more interesting thing in the Brazilian election that's been obscured by the whole Bolsonaro Lula debate is that at the legislative level, it seems like the center right really won. Um, this is not an endorsement of Lula and the left and a return to 2005. In some ways, it's a, if Bolsonaro wasn't so crazy, he would probably would have run away in a landslide sort of thing. Uh, but what's really happening here is Brazil, center-right, wants to be more pro-business and things like that, and is willing to, to go even to somebody like Bolsonaro um, to sort of put that through. So, but, but you focus on Brazil more than I do. So tell me, tell me what you're thinking about Brazil right now. Well, um, I mean, God, we could have a whole series of podcasts just on Brazil. Where do we even start? We might. Um, I think the the success of the center right indicates something that we've been focused on, which is sort of a hidden and growing normalization of things in Brazil that you would never know if you read the newspaper or you speak spoke to Brazilians. And I know my Brazilian friends are going to be pissed off at me for saying this um, because it goes against in many ways sort of the the psychology of, of Brazil, which is sort of really focused on things being out of control, violence, being afraid, um, sort of all the craziness that you that you see and you read about. But if you look at some of the other kind of more more stable indicators or more measurable things, like for example, um, in uh, Folha de São Paulo this week, which is the main newspaper in São Paulo, there was a really interesting survey that was done, and they surveyed business owners and executives and and people like that, and they asked them, you know, what is the thing that you worry most about right now? And, and therefore, what do you want the next administration to focus on, you know, fixing or addressing with their political capital? And you would think that they would be like, oh, you know, violence in the favelas, uh, disorder, chaos, you, you, you know, all of the things that are, that are always happening in, in Brazil. Inflation, um, you know, uh, uh, organized crime taking over significant chunks of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And the number one response was tax reform. Um, Because that's, that's been like a, in the background, there's sort of this policy um, uh, uh, change that's getting a lot of momentum and a lot of support to sort of make some tweaks to uh, certain aspects of the tax code and stuff like that. And that's so reassuringly boring. It's so normal. It's like something that they would say in Canada. Um, and I, I think that's a just sort of a, a latent indicator getting to our discussion a few weeks ago about why I'm really bullish on Brazil, that things are pretty good. And a lot of business people will tell you this. And, and a lot of business people are supporting Bolsonaro, you know, because of this, even though I, I don't think he has anything to do with things getting good, I think it's totally separate and he hasn't really done anything much from a policy standpoint or legislation uh, standpoint well, at all. Yeah, it's funny because we were we were talking about individuals and MBS and like um, 
this is where I can get kind of nimble because I would actually put more weight on what's happening in Saudi Arabia with MBS or more weight on what's happening in Russia with Putin. My hot, my quote unquote hot take on Brazil is probably it doesn't really matter if it's Lula or Bolsonaro. Like this country's too big and it's for the forces that are impelling its behavior are, are well beyond what any individual does. So unless unless he's going to call in the military for a coup and the military looks like it wants no part of that, it's sort of kept him at an arm's distance the entire time. Um, you know, it might be uncomfortable. You might have to deal with somebody you don't like who or who says crazy things when you're when they're in office. Brazilians like uh all Americans can sympathize with you. Like we have part candidates on both sides who say crazy things and stupid things in office the entire time. But you're bigger than that. Like the forces that impel Brazil will outweigh whatever crazy things whoever's in office is going to say. And Lula, Lula says his own crazy things too. Uh, go, go find his Time Magazine interview blaming the Russia-Ukraine war on Zelensky a couple months ago. It's not like he's some sort of perfect, virtuous chivalrous leader to take brazil into a a, a morally beautiful <laughs> decade or something yeah he's he's not um from an investment standpoint i think the opportunity here lies in the fact that the people who drive markets in the u.s and in brazil tend to be better educated wealthier people who are involved in business and investment and stuff like that on the coasts or in Sao Paulo and Rio and, and, and those areas. And they're on average much more focused on Bolsonaro as an individual because he's embarrassing to them. Um, he, he is like a Donald Trump figure. He says ridiculous, outrageous, in many cases, horrendous things. And um, that draws attention like a magnet. So everyone is focused on this election. Oh, it's, it's the biggest election. Is it, turnout's going to be really huge. You know, it's going to determine the future of Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. And I think you're right. I don't think it really matters all that much at the end of the day, um, certainly relative to the coverage that it gets. Yeah, I think what matters more for Brazil in some ways is that Brazil is one of these countries that it should, um, and should is a is a dangerous word, but let's let's use the word Brazil. If it can manage the policy situation even half well, like just basic competent policy, a multipolar world should be really really good for Brazil because it has the economic scale to do its own thing. It's the center of geopolitical gravity in that region, not just because of its size, but because Argentina is a basket case and has really seeded a lot of that. It has a lot of commodities, but its economy is more than commodities. So it can have cheap commodities in some ways, but it doesn't have to just, it's not um, consigned to just repeat the Latin America boom bust commodity cycle over and over and over again. If it doesn't want to, if it has sound policy at the top, driving investment in the right place. In some ways, globalization was terrible for Brazil because instead of becoming that dominant power in, um, in South America, it became more of um you know a place for the chinese to buy soybeans and that's exactly what brazil doesn't want it doesn't want to be a commodity clearinghouse for the rest of the world it wants to move up that value chain and be a little bit more muscular <laughs> geopolitically be a little bit more protectionist of those industries that will allow it to become more than a commodity producer and a in a multipolar world brazil can do that and it, it, it has a continent it can dominate with no enemies around it to try and do so it's at that sort of macro 10-year fundamental level not many countries have it as good as brazil does You don't often see countries with 180 million population that are only about commodities. Is that fair to say? I'm thinking of any counter examples to that, but Brazil is just way too big to be about iron ore and soybeans and well, Russia and that's, but, but Russia is a huge sprawling country across an entire landmass with terrible weather and an authoritarian, like repressive political regime. And it's like, it's, yeah, I mean, but, but Russia is an example, I mean, of, of a country yeah, that is that true. scale that hasn't been able to ascend. But Russia is also a great example of what happens if you don't get the policy right. Like Russia had to engage in certain policies to keep the country together that were bad for the economy. This war is a great example. This war is bad for the economy. It's not good. Brazil doesn't necessarily have to do that. They have no Ukraine on their border. They have no issue that needs them to militarize rather than just focus on business. All right. Well, on that note, um, check out the episode on Monday with uh, my good friend Farzam. His name is Abdul Rasul Div Salar. His, uh, his nickname is Farzam. It was a very insightful conversation about what's going on in Iran. Um, I feel like I actually have a handle on what's going on after talking to him. So cheers. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.